just say, coming on the heel of Mr. Singh, uh, one of the lecturers, former lecturers, that I'm a product actually of one of those reforms uh, in the Department of Information System. So I, I hope I'll deliver. Um, so I wanted to start by really talking about the whole focus of the conversation today and my presentation is about disruptive democracy. Um, and really the premise is that we, we have a system of democracy which is represented, which is based on represent, representation because, well, historically the technology we have today is there. So this model of representation was an alternative to the ideal, which is direct democracy, if you involve directly making decisions, right? So this presupposition doesn't hold true in a society where almost everybody has a mobile phone. You look in this room, but of course the data maybe 50% of the country has mobile technology. But if you look in this room, you're not part of that. You know, you're 100% for sure uh, mobile technology in this room. So the first is a conflict between direct and representative democracy. Sentiments that are expressed on Facebook and Twitter, for example, often become policy. And we know that, we have examples. You know, the world is always looking to hear what Donald Trump is going to say, President Trump of the United States, on his Twitter, because these things are also indications of policy. And very recently, um, a good friend, colleague, and somebody worked with um, Mr. Nigel Hughes, posted something very important on Facebook, in his opinion. And that became the subject of significant discussion and the course of action um, that has you know, sort of unfolded since then. So therefore, spaces outside of formal spaces have become increasingly significant in how people are engaging with government and how they are engaging in decision making and how they want to express their own points of view about how their society is to be governed. So the literature today talks about citizen involvement in good governance and, it's, and it talks about constant interactive governance, uh, Sorensen and Torfin of 2005. It talks about new public governance, Osborne 2005, open innovation, uh, Chesbro 2003, and community participation. But there are really four reasons why people get involved in the first place. The first is that they care about the issue. They feel they can change the issue. Um, they feel it's easy to get involved. And that easy, that ease of you know, getting involvement is, is sort of hyper, uh, it, it, it's become hyper in society with social media. And the fourth is that they, they want their efforts to be noticed. Right? So, a lot of what I'm talking about here was uh, part of research that I did, uh, Mr. Williams when I was in a lecture a few years ago, and he wanted me to even get deep, uh, take a deep dive into some burning research questions I wanted to answer. So I wanted to really use my own personal experience, and actually this year I'm not going to myself, I, I've been celebrating 20 years of community development work, um, so at the age of 13, so this is my 20th year anniversary, two decades. I, and I wanted to answer the question that has sort of been in my mind for a long time. You go everywhere and people have their own idea about how their community is going to be developed. But it's, it's sometimes they just don't have the information, they don't have the, uh, the access, and they don't have the resources. So how do we solve that fundamental problem? Was to bring this platform together, right? So although it sounds straightforward, um, there are, most cases, where the people who are most passionate about the history are not always the ones that have the resources and the capacity. And therefore, part of the civic engagement, disruptive democracy model builds on social capital, where people look out for each other and they are sharing information and sharing their positions to sort of hide highlight their minority positions. So social capital then became an important ingredient in creating this, uh, this sustainable community participation online. And we can see that already there is some, and Minister of Twitter and lots of other speakers included to it, there is already the conception of impact on social cohesion, uh, information justice, economic justice, and equity. So when we consider the technology, it's, all, it's important to consider not only the capacity of the end users, which is the people, but also the capacity of government. And we know 50% of Guyana is online, 47% um, of persons are using uh, mobile phones, and there's a, there's a large gap between the underserved and those served on the coast and those underserved in the hinterland region. 
youth are keeping a track and using Facebook and Twitter and mobile technology to document and coordinate. But many organizations and most governments are still paper driven. But this is not necessarily a problem as those technologies exist to bring both worlds together. So I want to talk a little bit about some examples because I think it will be useful for us. iCivics is one example in the United States. This is an online platform really founded by uh, former justice in the United States, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in 2009. And they reimagined civic engagement by using game technology, online game technology, for young people to really get into the virtual space, sometimes in the White House, pretend for a day to be the president. And you're the president, you've got your avatar, and you use that platform. My favorite one, I think I brought the fly up, because the name is interesting. It's called Descent. I'm not advocating anything. But Descent uh, stands for Decentralized Citizens in Decentralized Citizens Engagement Technology. And this is a massive project out of, uh, in the European Union. And this project really was a was a amalgamation of several smaller projects in uh, Barcelona, in Finland, we know very much about the Estonian model and so on. Um, but Decent uh, is a citizen-led uh, transformative platform. Uh, it's been helping to develop the next generation of open source, distributed, and privacy-aware tools for direct democracy um, and economic empowerment. What we know is that participatory budgeting has been a good example as a low-hanging fruit, sort of a minimum viable product for testing the implementation of citizen uh, participation. In Brazil, online civic engagement for participatory budgeting, uh, it dwarfed traditional offline participation and accounted for a seven-fold increase in the vote cast over the prior year, where there was no online presence. Additionally, 50% of those who participated went onto their very social media to persuade others to participate. And 60% of those who interacted with the online participatory platform uh, for budgeting were previously politically dead. In other words, this is a space to reach people who, and to involve people who otherwise would not be. So I really want to challenge this in closing uh, to think about how technology and disruptive democracy can really help us to reimagine our own democratic context, where we have to deal with issues of social cohesion and so on. Imagine parliament on the third population, such as young people or indigenous people, have a proportion of their, uh, the proportion of the vote in the National Assembly is accounted for by their direct participation with their mobile phone. And my last one minute to close is to say that this will really depend upon a recognition of that changing philosophy of democratic engagement, a facilitation of knowledge pooling, and the simplification of decision making processes, uh, engagement at local community level, uh, sort of, sort of uh, raising the profile of those ICT hubs, and a mainstreaming of rural proofing. So I wanted to close on that and to say that this model, over two years, has been a thought, thought a sort of a thought for me, but it's a conceptual framework available, it is implementable. I see the chair of the PUC here, I see the head of GTT, and I see a minister. So please, you can put some resources and implement it.